everything was perfectly swell. There were no prisons, no slums, no insane asylums, no cripples, no poverty, no wars. All diseases were conquered. So was old age. Death bearing accidents was an adventure for volunteers. The population of the United States was stabilized at 40 million souls. One bright morning in the Chicago Lying In Hospital, a man named Edward K. Welling Jr. waited for his wife to give birth. He was the only man waiting. Not many people were born a day anymore. Welling was 56, a mere stripling in a population whose average age was 129. X-rays had revealed that his wife was going to have triplets. The children would be his first. Some of us only dream about being able to live forever. Developments in science can lead to immortality. Delaying the aging process can cause various outcomes. Most importantly, the birth of new life forms. To restrain and keep order of the population can become catastrophic. This piece identifies the issue at hand if science does continue to prevail. Keep in mind that we've already come far in the advancement of technology, so one can only guess what lies next for us. I have chosen to interpret a piece by Kurt Vonnegut Jr. called To Be Our Zero To Be. The room was being redecorated. It was being redecorated as a memorial to a man who had volunteered to die. A sardonic old man, about 200 years old, sat on a stepladder painting a mural he did not like. Back in the days when people aged visibly, his age would have been guessed at 35 or so. Aging had touched him that much before the cure for aging was found. The mural he was working on depicted a very neat garden. Men and women in white, doctors and nurses, trimmed the soil, planted seedlings, sprayed bugs, spread fertilizer. Men and women in purple uniforms pulled up weeds, cut down plants that were old and sickly, raked leaves, carried refuse to trash burners. Never, 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 not even in medieval Holland nor old Japan had a garden been ever more formal, been better tended. Every plant had all the loam, light, water, air, and nourishment it could use. A hospital orderly came down the corridor singing under his breath a popular song. If you don't like my kisses, honey, here's what I will do. I'll go see a girl in purple. I'll go see her and kiss her toodaloo. If you don't want my loving, why should I take all up this space? I'll get off this old planet. Let some sweet baby take my place. In the year 2000, said Dr. Hitz, before scientists stepped in and laid down the law, there wasn't even enough drinking water to go around and nothing to eat but seaweed. And still, People insisted on their right to reproduce, like jackrabbits, and their right, if possible, to live forever. I want those kids, said Welling quietly. I want all three of them. Of course you do, said Dr. Hitz. That's only human. I don't want my grandfather to die either, said Welling. Nobody's really happy about taking a close relative to the cat box, said Dr. Hitz gently, sympathetically. I wish people wouldn't call it that, said Leora Duncan. What, said Dr. Hitz? I wish people wouldn't call it the cat box and things like that, she said. It gives people the wrong impression. You're absolutely right, said Dr. Hitz. Forgive me. He corrected himself gave the municipal gas chambers their official title, a title no one ever really used in conversation. I should have said, ethical suicide studios, he said. That sounds so much better, said Leora Duncan. 
This child of yours, whichever one you decide to keep, Mr. Welling, said Dr. Hitz, he or she is going to live on a happy, roomy, clean, rich planet, thanks to the population control. In a garden like that mural there, he shook his head. Two centuries ago, when I was a young man, it was a hell that nobody thought could last another 20 years. Now, centuries of peace, and plenty stretch before us, as far as the imagination cares to travel, he smiled luminously. The smile faded as he saw that Welling had just drawn a revolver. Welling shot Dr. Hitz dead. There's room for one, a great big one, he said. And then he shot Leora Duncan. It's only death, he said to her as she fell. There, room for two. And then he shot himself making room for all three of his children. Nobody came running. Nobody. Nobody seemingly heard the shots. The painter sat on top of the stepladder, looking down reflectively on the sorry scene. The painter pondered the mournful puzzle of life, demanding to be born, and once born, demanding to be fruitful, to multiply, and to live as long as possible. To do all that on a very small planet that would have to last forever. All the answers that the painter could think of were grim. Even grimmer, surely, than a cat box, a happy hooligan. An easy go. He thought of war. He thought of plague. He thought of starvation. He knew that he would never paint again. He let his paintbrush fall to the drop cloths below. And then he decided he had had about enough of life in the happy garden of life, too, and he came down slowly from the ladder. He took Welling's gun, really intending to shoot himself, but he didn't have the nerve. And then he saw the telephone booth in the corner of the room. He went to it, dialed the well-remembered well -remembered number two. B R zero two B. Federal Bureau of Termination said the very warm voice of a hostess. How soon can I get an appointment? He asked, speaking very carefully. We would probably fit you in this late afternoon, sir, she said. It might even be earlier if we can get a cancellation. All right, said the painter. Fit me in if you please and he gave her his name, spelling it out. Thank you, sir, said the hostess. Your city thanks you, your country thanks you, your planet thanks you, but the deepest thanks of all is from future generations.